March 19th, 2002. I was recently recruited to work for the US government, and today I'm preparing for my first case. We're investigating a company called Ryon Global, as reports have surfaced that they're performing unauthorized and illegal genetic enhancements on the animals whose meat they would then sell. From that introduction, you may assume I work for the FDA, maybe the CDC. Both assumptions are wrong. I work for the FBI. My name is Dexter Watson and, to be more specific, I work for the supernatural branch of the FBI, and I'm well aware such a branch doesn't exist. We, as opposed to one of those other more mundane organizations, were called in because these genetic enhancements may have crossed over what we call the Clarkson threshold. I'm not sure why we call it that. I'm still new here, but it describes the invisible line separating the things the public knows from the things we prevent them from knowing. The FDA and CDC, they're well below the Clarkson threshold. As I said, I'm still new here. I was a junior in college last year when they started recruiting me. I was at Penn State on a football scholarship, the only way I could afford to attend any college. And they had been putting me through a few tests I didn't actually know were tests when they were happening, which was rather frightening. Regardless, I passed them all and I was informed of my passing by an unmarked envelope. Also included in that letter was an offer. Meet them at a disclosed location for a job offer. It was as simple as that. There was no figure given, no description either. The only information at all provided was, at the bottom, a modified version of the FBI's logo. It was like the normal logo, all except the red and white striped insignia on the front where normally it was blank. On this version, there were two things in front of it. There was a sort of oblong, ovular shape running diagonally, and crossed with it was a long rectangle, with various sections of it jutting in or out to create a very clunky shape. No one has told me what either of them represent as of yet. I'm not sure why I took the job. Maybe it was because I was tired of doing nothing with my life. Maybe it was the allure of high pay and job security, or hell. Maybe it was because I wanted to help people. Whatever the reason was, I met them at the location and after hearing the details of the job, accepted. Three weeks of vigorous training and briefings later, I'm here two days away from my first mission. It's a routine one to be sure, as while genetic enhancements sound exciting and dangerous, they hardly ever turn out to be so, at least so I'm told. They say we usually catch on to them before it gets out of hand as genetic engineering leaves a pretty obvious energy signature when one knows where to look for it. I've been partnered with Scarlett Gill, an agent who joined right around the same time as me and as a result we were together throughout the majority of our training. We've spent quite a bit of time together as a result, but very little time is allowed for personal talk during the three introductory weeks. We've worked out, drilled and joked together and we'd even come to like each other but neither of us had been allowed to know a thing about the other's personal life until training was complete. We're together now, Scarlett and I, as we pass the time the night before the job. She's certainly nice and enjoyable enough to be around, but more importantly, she's loyal. The FBI seems to enjoy making us believe we're in life-threatening scenarios, when, in fact, it's merely another drill, something we enjoy significantly less, but every time they have, she's had my back wire to wire. Apparently, noticing my introspective attitude, she raised her eyebrows and said, Penny for your thoughts? I'm afraid you wouldn't be getting your money's worth. I shrugged. It's just a little weird. These past three weeks have been a bit of a whirlwind. And the most boring thing we've done is about to be our first assignment. I'm still holding out hope that we're going to run into some kind of mutant chicken or something. She joked. Maybe a man-eating cow. Are we really lowering our standards for excitement to a man-eating cow? I replied. I mean, even I wasn't that pessimistic. Whatever, she said, rolling her eyes and leaning back in her chair. I'm just ready to be out of this place, to see people again. Maybe the CEO will be some cute single guy who just needs the right girl to get him back on track. Maybe I'll meet the man of my dreams on this mission. I mean, it's Maine. You can't be expecting Ben Affleck. I jokingly teased. Don't get your hopes up. 
Oh, and what? I assume Jennifer Lopez is waiting there for you. She responded, something like that. I nodded and she left. We both joked, sharing some pre-mission banter, but in reality, there would be no matchmaking during the mission, and we both knew it. We would be arriving unannounced, and there was no telling how anyone at the company would react. Sure, it was just your average check-in to keep them honest, but what if they panicked? It wouldn't be the least likely thing to happen. When the laughter trailed off into silence, Scarlett said, You know what? We should probably get to bed. It's a long drive to Maine. Sure is, I replied. We, being rookies on a routine mission, hadn't been found important enough to garner a full-on flight, so we were stuck driving one of the old, clunky SUVs the Bureau kept to the best of my knowledge, for the sole purpose of hazing. So, yawning, I bid her good night, and we retreated to our respective bunks for the night. March 20th. I'm not usually prone to nightmares, but I had one last night. It was a forest, I believe, and a faceless man stood in front of me. Behind him and to his left lay a wild horse, bucking and neighing loudly. It was surrounded by thorns and every time it reared back on its hind legs, it came down, impaling itself on them. To his right was Scarlet, bound at her hands and feet. I didn't know what was going on. I tried to ask him, but I found that I was frozen in place, unable to move or do anything as the faceless man looked down at me tauntingly. I woke in a cold sweat an hour before my alarm was set to go off, so I quietly showered, got dressed, and walked outside, allowing the brisk morning air to fill my lungs. It was always calming, being out this early. It put it all in perspective. The assignment was just an assignment. My dream was just a dream. The base we were at was tucked away in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, by far the most beautiful place I'd been in my life. And as the sun rose to the east, I leaned on a railing overlooking an immense horizon. The mountain dropped off beneath me, only to pick up in a forest that spread out below me. After what must have been miles of forest, the first rays that would eventually become the blazing ball of light that was the sun peeked out at me. I took a deep breath in, then exhaled. I always wondered why they wasted such a great view on a military base. A voice from behind surprised me, causing me to jump slightly. I turned around to see Carmen Clay, my direct superior, who coincidentally had been promoted to her post at around the same time Scarlett and I had arrived. She walked over to the railing and leaned on it as well, looking out across the horizon. So much natural beauty, contrast it with the stark coldness of the Bureau. It's two different worlds. I cleared my throat and replied, Yes, ma'am. She looked at me for a moment. You have something not a lot of people do, you know. You know how to talk yourself off the ledge and that'll get you a long way in this business, she said. Thank you, ma'am. She gazed down at the forest for another moment before continuing. A wise man once told me that for everything that goes right in a mission, ten more are bound to go wrong by the time you finish celebrating. Remember that. I nodded, letting her words sink in as she returned to the main compound. At first, it just seemed like she was getting in on the fun of piling on the new guy, but that didn't at all fit what I knew about her. There was more to the saying than just a poke in the ribs. Scarlet was awake a half hour later, and a briefing followed not long after. The briefing was relatively short. We already knew most of the details. It was just some general information that hadn't been covered yet. Then, we were off, just like that. There was no send-off, no hearty goodbye, the briefing ended, and we were on our way. It was a three-hour drive to Rion's headquarters in Old Town, Maine, and I drove the first half, Scarlet picking up the back end. The conversation remained light when it was alive, which wasn't the majority of the ride, but still, there was a generally optimistic feel to the ride. First we passed the sign informing us we'd entered Maine, a milestone achieved very early on in our journey, then we passed through Bethel, then Skowhegan, then Bangor, and finally, we saw the signs for Old Town. Our massive, bulky SUV stood out in the small town, even as we neared the center of industry that was the Ryon headquarters. All the vehicles up here were small, either tiny sedans or, for the more wealthy drivers, little convertibles or sports cars. We towered over almost all of them, and word spread fast in small towns like these. People were wondering why we were there, and they weren't shy about showing it. We drew stairs, and the closer we got to our destination, a few people even took out their phones and dialed a number when they saw us. When a third person did so, I pointed it out to Scarlett. 
Someone's getting advance notice that we're here, I told her, gesturing back to the man on the phone. They're tightening it up here, so much for the element of surprise. She nodded. Not a great sign. If they got people out to let them know if someone's coming, they've probably got something to hide. With that, we came into view of the massive, sprawling complex. The Ryan headquarters was a sight to behold. The main entrance dominated by a huge statue of the company's logo in the middle of a U-shaped driveway. The front of the building was a large glass room, but at the height the sun was in the sky, we couldn't see into it yet. The glass rose up to more than two stories high, then dipped back down before turning into cement and rising up into offices on the higher levels. It was only six stories high, but its size came in its width. We had just reached the far edge of the building, and we still had nearly a quarter mile to go to reach the entrance in the middle of it. The headquarters seemed big enough to be its own city. Why would anyone need this much space? Scarlet murmured, echoing my thoughts. As she approached the driveway, she asked, do we just park in there? I don't see a lot or anything. We've got government plates. It's not like we're going to get towed, but that's definitely weird. I concurred, and she pulled into the driveway behind the fountain, parking the car in front of the front doors. There was a surprising lack of activity, I noticed, as we approached the glass doors. Ours was the only car in the long driveway, and we appeared to be the only people making our way into the building. And, as we entered, we saw that it was empty as well save for a receptionist at the desk. I glanced curiously at Scarlet as no greeting came from her, and we slowly let the door close behind us. Hello, ma'am. Scarlet called out, her voice echoing around the silent lobby. We're here with the FBI. We'd like to take a look around. There was no response. It was a large lobby, and it took us some time to get closer after several more unsuccessful attempts at communication. Our footsteps on the tile filled the otherwise empty room as we made our way towards the desk, and then as details became more clear, it was obvious that something was off. The receptionist had a blank look on her face, so she wasn't asleep, yet still she didn't reply. We hadn't noticed until we got far enough away from the windows that the natural light failed to reach us, but the lights were out. We both felt the oddness of the situation, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw Scarlet's hand drift over to the butt of her pistol, prepared to draw it at a moment's notice. I did the same. When we arrived at the desk, she still hadn't reacted to us or even moved. Something was definitely wrong. Wordlessly, I waved my hand in front of her eyes for a moment. Nothing. Then, I held the back of my hand in front of her nose. I glanced up at Scarlet. Nothing, I said. She's dead. Dead? She asked, surprised. What the hell? Why is she still at the desk? Maybe she had a condition, I guessed. Call it in. I'll check for a bracelet or something. She nodded and retreated a few steps back to report it back to our superiors, and I made my way around the desk. There was no indicator anywhere to show that she had some sort of medical condition, but it wasn't long before I did find the cause of death. When I tilted her body forwards, a bullet wound slowly oozed out blood. It was a small hole, most likely a pistol caliber, and when I opened her shirt to find the exit wound, I saw that someone had cleaned it up. What in the name of... I mumbled, looking over to Scarlet, who was still fiddling with her radio. When she saw me looking, she said, Damn thing won't work, I'm just getting static. What's the deal with her? She was killed, I replied, and someone didn't want us to know. They cleaned up the front of it, so... Then it clicked. We both came to the epiphany practically simultaneously. I vaulted over the desk, making for the door across the long lobby, and as I did so, the metal safety grate began to slide down, its gears grinding loudly as it slowly began the process of cutting off our path to freedom. Scarlet had a head start, having already been on the other side of the desk, and she reached the doors when the grate was still almost a foot off the ground. She pounded on the glass with her fist, then, after it was unsuccessful, she slipped her gun out of its holster and fired it into the glass once, twice, three times. However, the bullets didn't penetrate. The glass was bulletproof. Damn it, she shouted, slamming the butt of her gun into the ground. I caught up with her at that point, and I looked through the thin slits that allowed light in through the grate. 
What the hell is going on? I breathed, shaking my head. Scarlet slowly stood and she looked out into the lobby. We're stuck in here. For a moment her words echoed faintly down the dark room, and we let it sink in, taking stock of our situation. Something was going on, something that somebody was willing to kill to keep under wraps. Whoever it was was very wealthy and intelligent. They had not only known to jam radio frequencies, but had the means of doing it, and they were either in a position of power at the company, or commanded enough respect to lead enough followers to establish this lockdown. I had narrowed it down to either the CEO or a head scientist with the CEO being the more likely of the two, but this was all in the first minute of having this knowledge. So, what now? Scarlet asked, sliding her gun back into her holster. There's only one thing we can do, I replied. Find out what they're trying to hide. Are you crazy? She exclaimed. This was supposed to be a routine checkup. We're not equipped to get in a gunfight. For all we know, a terrorist cell could have taken this place hostage and their arm to the teeth. Outside assailants, a situation I hadn't thought of. Well, what else would we do? I asked. Even if we want to look for an exit and get out of here, the only direction we can go is into the looking glass. I don't like that metaphor, she noted. Then, she relented. But, yes, I suppose you're right. And if we're going into the deadly genetic engineering lab, we might as well do our job. I finished, and she nodded. So much for Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez, she muttered as we began the walk to the hallway that would take us to the rest of the building. The lobby was set up so that the receptionist would be able to have seen anybody attempting to enter the complex. There was no furniture, not even a potted plant, just cold, white tile, and then the desk. Behind the desk were two doors, one on the left, one on the right, and each led different places as we'd learned in the briefing. To the left was the business end of the headquarters. Decisions, accounting, and computing occurred there. To the right was the scientific portion of it. Laboratories and testing chambers took up the majority of the real estate there, and that was where we were headed. If an answer lay anywhere in this darkened house of death, we believed it to be there. So I took point, and we entered the looking glass. The lights were still out in the hallway we entered, and it was nearly impossible to see. Scarlet pulled out her flashlight and clicked it on, the thin beam piercing through the darkness and lighting up a tiny area of the hall. It wasn't much, but it was better than the original pitch black, if only by a little. The suffocating darkness surrendered little to help us piece together this mystery. For the most part, it was just a white, sterile hallway, like the lobby, without any form of decoration. Every so often we'd see something off, like a dark smear on a wall, or a fluorescent light casing that had been torn out of its original shell and smashed on the ground. But for the most part, during the first hallway, there was nothing. However, when we reached the end of it, and arrived at a door, things began to ramp up. The door was the same material as the rest of the hallway and had it not been cracked slightly open, it was highly likely we wouldn't have even noticed it. Upon closer inspection, I saw that there was a thumbprint scanner to the right of it, and it must have utilized electronic locks, which would have gone out whenever the power did. Do we go in? Scarlet whispered. I mean, we're already in this far, I replied in an equally low voice. What's the worst that can happen? Don't say that. You know it never ends well, she pleaded. I rolled my eyes and pulled the door open further, allowing us to look inside before we entered. The room appeared to be a testing chamber for the genetic engineering. About 10 feet in, there was a glass wall with a heavily secured door in the center, leading to an airlock and then the area where the tests were performed began. There was a table with straps on it, several cages in the corner, and then a chair with straps on it. All were splattered with dark red, oozing blood. I groaned slightly at the sight, and then the smell hit me through the airlock. It hit like a ton of bricks, and I keeled over as if I'd been hit by one. I nearly retched at the putrid stink of it, and I thought there was no way I was going to make it further. I was about to say something when Scarlet beat me to it. What's wrong? She asked, pointing her pistol around the room to check for danger. Are you okay? You don't smell that. I said, tears in my eyes as mercifully I became adjusted to the smell. God, that's rancid. Smell what? Just the blood? She asked, sniffing. There's something else. There must be a body in there or something. I groaned, slowly coming to my feet with a hand from Scarlet. 
It's starting to fade, but you're telling me you didn't smell anything. No, that's strange, she muttered. Come on, let's see if we can find anything in there. It didn't occur to me then that anything was strange about this experience. I just assumed that perhaps the smell had dissipated by the time she'd entered the room. Or maybe it was one of those things where people with a recessive gene couldn't smell it or something. So, I followed her in. The blood was dried, it looked like it had been for at least a day, and it covered virtually every surface. As I circled around, trying to find any semblance of a clue as to what happened, I spotted a camera in the top right corner. I was about to point it out to Scarlet, when suddenly, a noise from behind us caused us both to freeze. It was a slight scratching sound, like a very small animal was burrowing around. That was the one corner we hadn't yet searched. Of course it was, and it was also obscured from our initial view by the low wall that cut off the glass viewing area, so we had no idea what was there. The scrabbling continued, noticeably muffled, and then there was an odd squish. The noises paused for a moment and I slowly turned my head to lock eyes with Scarlet. The unspoken agreement to turn and pump whatever was back there full of lead passed between us, and we held our breath for half a second. Then, we whipped around, firing round after round into the corner, the bursts of light obscuring the dark corner from our view. After a few moments, I stopped, and she followed. I shined my flashlight into the corner and saw a bloodied, shredded, unrecognizable lump. Whatever happened to it, it was dead long before we had gotten there. What the hell made that noise, she whispered, our thoughts along the same lines. I didn't respond, out of fear for the answer. We stood there in silence for a moment, neither especially wanting to be the one to volunteer to investigate the pulp. Fine, I'll do it. I relented, reluctantly returning my gun to its holster. But you owe me one. She rolled her eyes and I cautiously approached the lump that glistened sickeningly in the light of Scarlet's flashlight. Upon closer inspection, I could almost make out the form of a human torso, however destroyed. All of the skin, at least the skin that would have been facing us, had been torn off, explaining the bloodied appearance. There was only one arm left, the left one, and it was tucked under the body until I pulled it out. It was clenching something in its hand, a slip of paper, it appeared, and I attempted to pry it loose. Hurry up, Scarlet urged. I think I heard something from out in the hall. That's just your imagination, I replied, tugging on the paper. It was wedged tightly in, and the person must have had an iron grip. Then, right as the corpse began to seed its grip, something burst out of its back. It was a flurry of claws, teeth, and a tail, and I stumbled backwards, crying out as the thing leapt out at me. What is it? Scarlet exclaimed, her attention having been focused on the entrance to the hallway. As I recovered from my initial shock, I realized the tiny ball of fury was just that. Tiny, it looked like a rat, a decently sized one, for sure, but there was something wrong with it. I didn't have much experience with rats, but the way it walked, the dull look in its beady little eyes, something about it was off. You baby, Scarlet teased, helping me up after I picked the rat off of me and tossed it into the corner opposite the one with the body. What, a little rat scared you? I don't like it, I said, referring to our situation as a whole. Something's wrong here. Scarlet glanced around at the carnage. Really, you have a team of monkeys working around the clock on that one. That rat, it wasn't normal, I said, ignoring her sarcasm. This place, why is it covered in blood? That was a human body, was, what happened to it? Then I heard what Scarlet must have heard earlier. There was the sound of someone or something pounding on metal. Three dull thuds. Then a hollow groan permeated down the hallway. Is that? I whispered, trailing off. Yeah, she returned in an equally low tone. Whatever it is, it's in between us and the exit. Wordlessly, I drew my gun once more, nodded at the door, and we cautiously crept back towards the hallway, out of the testing chamber. As we left, the rat scurried off behind us, slightly startling us. With that, we set off. The unspoken agreement between us was that if whatever had made that sound earlier decided to do so again, we would investigate. Chances are, we would be spending an undesirable amount of time with it anyway in the coming days, I figured. So why not get acquainted early? I obviously wasn't keen on meeting the thing. I only wanted to do it if the opportunity arose, but I was hoping internally that it wouldn't. 
However, as it often was, my hope was unfounded. Before we'd even reached the halfway point, a terrifying shriek came from the door we'd just passed. Then, before we could react, something slammed into the glass porthole at the top of the door. I jumped back, training my pistol on the 8 inch circle of glass as whatever it was dragged across the clear surface, smearing what looked like blood across it. I held a finger to my lips as Scarlet glanced at me and she nodded. There was no movement for a moment, so I slowly approached the door and reached for the knob when whatever was behind the door let out a mighty roar and then it slammed its head into the window. I must have jumped a mile at the noise and I quickly regained my wits, aiming my gun back at the small viewport into the room. What I saw was disturbing, to say the least. Though it was pressed up against the glass and slightly distorted from it, I could tell it was a human, or at least it had been human at some point. It had stringy black hair that was matted down with blood. Blood that streaked across the glass as the creature pressed harder and harder against it, trying to break through. Its skin was a human shade, but it was stretched and waxy, looking as if it could be torn apart like paper. Then, its eyes. The emotion, or lack thereof I'd seen in the beady eyes of the rat was amplified a hundredfold in the eyes of this creature. There was nothing. Two empty pits, devoid of all color and life, entirely black. There was no iris, no white. They were pitch black. As it continued pounding on the door, much to our horror, several more groans and thuds began emanating from all around the hallway. There were more of those creatures all throughout the hallway and, worse, not all of the doors were locked. Come on, we have to go. I shouted over the din, and we began running down towards the lobby. Hands groped out at us through the darkness. One of them even made a flailing attempt to body check me, but no serious threat was posed to us until we were 10 feet away from the exit. One of the doors flung open at that moment, and I ran directly into it. I was momentarily stunned, and it knocked me off my feet. My gun fell out of my hand, skittering off into the darkness. I heard Scarlet utter a curse and she was about to start shooting at the thing when suddenly one of them grabbed me from behind. Help. I shouted, still disoriented, trying to attack the creature grabbing me. She whipped her head around and in her moment of distraction, the one that had opened the door took a hold of her. She slammed her elbow into its gut and prepared to duck under the gap provided by its reaction, but it had none. Instead, it reared back its head and then sunk its teeth into the upper part of her arm. Tearing at it aggressively, she cried out in pain. Meanwhile, I was just hardly avoiding a similar fate. I'd managed to get a position of leverage on the head of the creature, but it was strong and untiring. I could feel my strength giving way when suddenly, I heard a door burst open ahead of me. Initially, I thought it was just more of the creatures emerging to snuff out the last remaining bits of life in us. I thought that was the end, and I closed my eyes, lessening my hold on the creature's head. Then, instead of the jaws of death, I heard a dull clunk and felt the weight lifted off of me. I opened my eyes to see that the creature had been sent stumbling backwards, a serious dent in the center of his face. Get up, get up. A voice shouted, and a figure appeared in my vision, extending a hand to help me. Come on, we've gotta go. I accepted his help, and the first thing I noticed when I got to my feet that he was wearing a surgical mask. Then, I noticed that he was carrying a crowbar. Seeing my confused look, he said, I'll explain later, we have to get out of here. Wait, wait, I protested. Scarlet was still struggling feebly against the creature that had bit into her arm, and I rushed over to her, grabbing onto the creature's head and prying apart its teeth. Go, go, I hissed to Scarlet. Free from the thing's maw, she made for the exit immediately and I followed not too long after, once I had stunned the creature sufficiently that it wouldn't be following directly behind us. However, during that time, the way to the exit slowly began to close as more of the creatures pressed in. With a sudden burst of adrenaline, I sprinted forwards, bowling over two of them, and when one lunged out at me, I grabbed his wrist in a hold I knew so well it was practically automatic and snapped the flimsy bone. Then, I dove for the exit, tucking my body into a roll as I passed through the opening, and when I did so, our masked savior slammed the door shut behind me, sliding in several deadbolts I hadn't noticed before. They seemed hastily installed, and I guess they hadn't been there until those creatures were. Breathing heavily, I slowly made my way to my feet. Scarlet was sitting against the receptionist's desk, clutching her arm which was oozing blood steadily and the man in the mask turned back to face me when he finished locking up. 
What the hell is going on here? I panted. I suppose you're from the FBI, he remarked. I'll explain everything, don't worry. Well, perhaps you should be worried, but for different reasons. Yeah, I said, still sucking in air. I'm aware. You're going to want to come with me, he said. I could explain everything here, but trust me, it'll be much easier if we can get to everyone else. The walk to the rooms they'd established as their base was a strange one. The building seemed so normal, it just looked like an after-hours office building. I I'd judged by this time that night had come on our first day. Most of the rooms looked undisturbed, as if someone could step right in and begin working. However, the deeper we got into the business section of the building, the less and less likely that became. At first, it was just little things. A desk would be upturned, blocking a door, or a potted plant would have been knocked over, spilling dirt across the carpet. But then, it took a dark turn. Occasionally, dark blood would be smeared in gory streaks across a wall, or a corpse would lie unattended on the ground. Windows were shattered, the carpet was torn up and wall fixtures lay in shambles on the floor. Then, we entered the final hallway. At the end of this hallway were the now sealed doors that led to an elevator. From the blueprints I'd studied, I knew it to lead to the higher corporate offices. But we didn't go that way, instead entering the conference room in the middle of the hallway, on the left hand side. When he opened the door, he looked back to us, seemingly in thought for a moment. You two had better wait out here, just a precaution. Don't worry, they've never made it this far. I'll come and get you in just a minute. Glad to see you're rolling out the welcome wagon, I said, but he'd already entered the room. I helped Scarlett sit down and then slid to the floor myself, but not before taking a peek into the conference room. It was a dismal sight to behold. There were about 20 people there, all in various stages of grief or despair. Some huddled in groups, others sat alone, still others sat at the tables, tending to four wounded people who lay bleeding out on the large conference room tables. Some of the people wore surgical masks, though most didn't. The man who'd saved us was in deep conversation with three or four others, standing close to the entrance, away from the others. I glanced over at Scarlet and saw through the darkness that a tear was rolling down her cheek. I thought better of making small talk, and we waited in silence for about half a minute. Then, she was the one to break it. We're in over our head, she said. We have to find a way to contact someone. They have to come find a solution to this. We'll talk to this guy, I replied. But we can't get hysterical. We need to keep our wits about ourselves. We knew this was a possibility. Well, not this, but something of this magnitude. We're prepared. We can handle this. What makes you think that? She asked. What have you ever gone through in life that would make you assume you can handle this? At that moment, the door swung open and the man who'd led us there emerged. I was grateful for the distraction since I truly had no answer to her question. All right, I owe you an explanation, he said, sitting down across the hall from us. He paused for a moment as if expecting a response, but none came, so he continued. My name is Jace Morrison. I'm, er, I was the director of product management at Ryon. Since there's quite a bit to cover, I'll open it to you for where we begin. What do you want to know? I looked over to Scarlet, and she nodded, signifying she'd ask first. What the hell were those things? Did they have to do with the genetic engineering we're here to investigate? She asked, her curiosity almost bordering on eagerness despite her mortal wound. Jay sighed. Yes, they do. They are the product of what we're calling the IMM01 disease. Those things, they used to be human. And, to your second question, yes, it does have to do with genetic engineering. We're still not entirely sure how, but it is believed that one of the test subjects had an undiscovered, dormant genetic trait that was set off by the experimentation. That trait reacted negatively to the testing, producing IMM01. I'm sure it could be explained better, but you just met the those who could do it, and they're certainly in no position to do so. So you were experimenting on humans, Scarlet asked. This is worse than we thought. What is IMM-01? How does it spread? And what are its effects? I asked, signifying that he didn't need to answer her rhetorical question. IMM-01 is an airborne disease. However, it dies very quickly unless it finds a host. If it does so, it slowly begins to take over said host's body until it has gained complete control, at which point it rewires the brain to amplify aggression, delete pain receptors, and reduce logical thought. 
That process will generally take around 12 hours, at least to what we've seen, and visible signs that the host is infected will not begin to show until approximately the 10 hour mark. Can it be transferred once the host is converted? I asked, nervous that it could have been transmitted to us during our scuffle with the creatures. There has only been one instance of it, and it was after the creature had reached full maturity, which takes place 24 hours after the transformation is completed. At that point, the disease becomes fortified, being able to survive indefinitely outside of a host, and is present in the creature's very breath. I looked at Scarlet and saw that she'd reached a conclusion and that it was one she didn't like. You've known about this, haven't you? She asked accusingly. You know too much about it. You knew about the consequences, but if I may guess, you chose to test the creatures and disease instead of reporting it. Then an outbreak happened, and now we're here. He sighed again. Yes, but I assure you, the decision was entirely Mr. Rayon's himself. At this point, I'll take the story over myself. I'm sure you're also curious about the radio blackout, security gate, and the unfortunate death of Ms. Naomi West, the receptionist. That was all the result of our paranoid CEO, Andrew Rion. He was the one that ordered the genetic experimentation in the first place, and when he did so, he installed several measures that would ensure the headquarters could become entirely self-sustained in the event that such an event did occur. He has since separated himself from us. He locked himself in the corporate suites, where he just so happens to have full control of all security measures, at least the ones he can power with the backup generator. However, before he and those loyal to him retreated, he knew he was going to have to deal with inspectors, such as yourselves. So he shot Naomi, he cleaned up the wound and propped her up in the chair so that you would approach, giving him sufficient time to activate the security gate and frequency jammers. He is entirely delusional. His goal is to wait out the death of every living thing in this building, and then to continue with operations as normal. There is nothing we can do. We wouldn't put our own lives above that of the entirety of humanity, as if we were to make an attempt to escape, the risk would be too great that I am among one would follow, and I'm sure I don't need to explain the consequences of that. We have managed to secure all of the creatures we know of in the experimentation hallway. There are certainly a few that continue to roam unabated. Now we currently don't have a method for determining if a subject is or isn't infected, so if you two would spend the night in another office. Oh, yeah, of course, I said. I mean, is there anything you can do for her arm? I think the bleeding stopped, but an infection would probably be deadly there. He held his hands up helplessly. We have no medical supplies. If you've already stopped the bleeding, that's as much as I could have done. Scarlet nodded grimly and without another word, he left, returning to the conference room. She looked over to me after the door had closed. You still think we're ready for this? She asked. It's worse than we thought, I said, repeating her sentiment from earlier. You know how we're going to get out of here though, right? She asked. I grinned weakly, looking down the hall at the sealed metal doors. I sure do, I replied. Despite her sudden pessimism, she retained that calculating, planning mind that helped her so much during training, and we remained on the same page. Come on, help me up, she said. I'm not sleeping out here, let's find a nice office or something. The information having lifted her spirits, if only slightly, I lifted her up and we walked around for a few minutes before finding a suitable office. Then, as I helped her to lie down on a rather plush couch, she paused, looking curiously into my eyes. What? I asked. Then, the curiosity turned to fear. Give me your flashlight, she ordered. What's wrong? I asked, looking behind me. Just give it, she exclaimed, and I hastily retrieved it, handing it to her. She clicked it on, then shone it into my eyes. Gah, I exclaimed, shielding my eyes from the sudden burst of light. What's that for? Put that thing away. Show me your eyes, she demanded, and I opened them, squinting into the harsh light. Dexter, your eyes. She trailed off. What's wrong with them? I asked. What's going on with my eyes? They're black, she replied. What do you mean I began, and then the realization hit me. Scarlet slowly propped herself up on her good arm and inched back away from me. Stay back, she said, a look of fear in her eyes. Thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacy, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.